Bevan, we made it all the way to the third episode before we started drinking on set. So <laughs> I'm kind of proud of us, personally. I'm super proud of us. I would have thought it would have been after the first episode for sure. Totally. Um, and we're drinking uh, these lovely beverages. I have a cider from Ola Brew Company. They're a local brewery. They are. I've got the Hawaiian ginger hard seltzer. Is it good? It is good. Yeah. It is good. Mine's delicious. Last year they bought $100,000 worth of local produce in terms of making these drinks and this year they've extended it to $400,000. Wow, so all locally sourced um, and they have, their, they have a brewery that anyone who's here on the island can go there. It's near the pool. It's near the pool. Kind of in that industrial area behind the pool. Yeah. And look, mine has local pineapple in it. Look it up. I'm very excited. So you are watching Fitter and Feisty Kona Daily News Show. I'm Sarah Gross from Live Feisty Media. I'm Bevan McKinnon from Fitter Podcast. And coming up on the show, we have, we've got Lionel Sanders today. We're one of the only people on the island that's actually been able to gain access to Lionel Sanders, so that's pretty exciting. You did it, Bevan. You got in there. I'm so proud of you. I was sweating more than he was, <laughs> and I was standing, and he was cycling. We also have Kelsey Withrow. Imogen Simmons. And oh, and a word from Tim Don. Yeah, yeah, which is really interesting because uh, we caught up with Tim, he's not racing, but it's interesting to find out what he thinks about being here on the Big Island. Bevan, yesterday we talked to three people who have been world champions, yep. and on today's show we have a, a lineup of people who I think could be world champion. Yeah, definitely, and we got one of the only opportunities to speak with Lionel Sanders. He's going to be a favourite uh, for the podium, if not the win, in any Ironman that he actually enters and starts, so a, a one-off opportunity for us to have a chat to him. So here we are with Lionel Sanders. What I wanted to know from Lionel is, does he actually train for the transition from bike to run? I mean, if we were doing ITU stuff, then I'd do it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. But in Ironman, I mean, I don't... The transition itself, I don't find to be hugely important. I mean, obviously you don't want to spend 15 minutes in transition, but... And then the actual, like, running off the bike. I mean, I don't think there's any physiological change or something it's a little bit of discomfort of course going from down in the tt to the upright so the only workout anymore and i used to do it all the time i used to do bricks all the time then i just thought it was sacrificing speed for something that doesn't really exist so the only workout that i'll do off the bike now is a 5k up to 10k run after my long ride because that is the one where the most discomfort is, the most oddity after riding for so long. In terms of bricks, so show me more speed. I don't really want to run off the bike. Minimum one hour between bike and run so that I don't sacrifice speed for something that doesn't exist. I, I don't think of a change off the bike. Okay. All right. Well, that's so, probably a slightly different take sure. on it than other sure. athletes. But then you've never been shy on doing it differently. Yeah. Well, I mean, I used to do it all the time. So this last, uh, well, both Ironman Montrombe, well, this whole season thus far, Augusta and Trombon, I haven't done a single brick workout wow. in six months. So, but I ran quite well. I mean, you're always tired. Like you're always training with tired legs, right? I always do my run workout third, but I never do it off the bike, ever. So you can maintain the best quality possible? Always. And I actually, the guy who suggested that, I learned that from Soul Twitch, actually. When people saw I was doing all of my run workouts after bike, like right after biking. And a guy, uh, a guy from Tucson, what's his name? 
Desert Dude. That's his Soul Twitch name. That's his real name. I can't remember his real name. It's from Tucson, anyways. Yeah. He said, you got a lot of low-hanging fruit there. Yeah. Because you're always running tired. Yeah. So I made that change. And at the very least, it's a game of not overtraining yourself to death. And uh, at the very least, I haven't reducing the overtraining from not doing that. So, anyways, that's kind of my pick. Bevan, how did you get in there to get that clip? <laughs> if it wasn't for uh, Wahoo's powering our show, um, I don't know if we actually would have, but you know, they arranged an opportunity for me to finish a bike ride with Jocelyn McCauley. Mm -hmm. You can see that I'm a little bit sweaty. You're a little, yep, a little uh, glistening there. Yeah, a little yep. glistening. Um, I walked up beside Lionel whilst obviously there's a plethora of people around him. Uh, and just introduced myself. He remembered me from other podcasts that we've done together, and then we just asked him a question. And so, in the midst of a workout, he was happy to have a chat to us, which was, you know, awesome for us. Yeah, fantastic. And do you, when you're coaching athletes, pros or age groupers, yep. do you get them to run off the bike? You know, I'd actually say that I'd follow a little bit of what Lionel Sanders does. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that for a lot of age groupers, uh, the job is to make them the best runner possible. And sometimes that doesn't uh, happen when they run under fatigue. Mm -hmm. I like a small transition run. And so 25 to 30 minutes is something that I prescribe uh, relatively often. So they change mechanics from cycling to running. But I very rarely, maybe only in one simulation closer to the race, do I do something between, say, 60 to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm in favor of what Lionel says. What about yourself? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I was thinking about it after, after seeing you talk to Lionel, that I would coach different people in different ways. Okay. So for myself, because I was a pro and I was training full time, you know, sometimes doing 25, 30 hours a week, you know, you are going to run tired no matter what yeah. you do, right? Yeah. So running off the bike then becomes less important yep. because you're getting those adaptations of running tired, yeah. even if you don't never run off the bike yeah. versus a, an age group or amateur athlete who might do 15 hours of training a week. Yeah. I might intentionally load them up and get them to run off the bike so that they learn to run tired. So I think I would pick and choose it depending on the athlete, depending on their injury history as well, Excellent. and whether they can handle those longer sessions or not. So there's a lot of um, variation in, in what I would do. Yeah, and sure. I think in Lionel's case, he's learned a lot from his mistakes, mm. um, and he's changed his training. We've all tracked what he's done over the years. Um, but, you know, we've got some people coming to the island for the very first time who don't have that wealth of experience, and we had an opportunity to catch up with one of those people and spoke with Imogen Simmons. Hey, congratulations on 70.3 days. Thank you very much. Massive result for you. Yeah, that was that was quite a big one to be honest. I yeah. wasn't expecting it, so yeah, it has changed things. It's changed my yeah expectations perhaps, and other perhaps other people's. But i you know, Karen is a different thing. So yeah. So this is Iron we're, Man number two. We're going in naive and pretending to be naive. I'm not, no, I don't think anyone can pretend to be naive. <laughs> <laughs> Now your, your skill set, uh, great swimmer, really strong biker, really competent runner at 70.3. Uh, Frankfurt wasn't probably an illustration of what you think you're capable of the iron distance? Um, I mean Frankfurt was an interesting day, um, quite a few, okay, Ironman's a long one so from a spectator's point of view it might have looked a bit boring but actually from my perspective there was quite a lot happening, it was quite a dynamic race. Um, like people dropping shoes out of transition which broke up the group more than I'd expected and riding a nice long solo 160k bike ride is super fun um, but I imagine that's like I hope that's not going to be the case here and that there'll be more of a like well what if it dynamic is dynamic race well if that's the case then I've done it before so I can do it again um, would you be thinking to yourself or second guessing uh, your race strategy at any stage if you should find yourself in the lead for 160 k's on the bike? I, if, I, if I find myself in that situation, then I've definitely done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I should not be there. <laughs> and your coach, Jürgen Zach, would be uh, screaming. Be like, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how he used to try and race. Yeah, but I think I think we've got a different set of skills as well. Like, I'm no, Immo attack does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, new to the, you've been in Texas, but you live a lot of the time in Thailand. So, what are you feeling for the heat? Is this hot to you? Um, I think, I mean, it's 
It's hot, yeah. I think the big difference is in Thailand is that I have the option to train super early or late yeah. and avoid the midday heat, which it's really we're awesome. not going to be doing <laughs> on Saturday. Yeah. It's going to be hot, bright sunlight and uh, no shade really it seems. So well, Jan van Berkel said to me that he, you're his dark uh, horse as a pick because he reckons you go really well in the heat. Well, I don't know where he's got that from. I mean... <laughs> Other than the fact that we train, well, we didn't really train together in Thailand. We just ate a lot of meals together. <laughs> I like eating. <laughs> I think there's a theme coming through here. Yeah, invite me, invite me out for breakfast. So I'm there. <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, in the training that you've done in Texas and the training that you've done here, is this something that because you are a taller girl? Yeah. Um, people are going to say the bigger athletes don't cope with the heat as well. Is this hot to you? Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, if anyone can say it's not hot to them, then yeah. please introduce yourselves because I'm yeah. fascinated about your physiology. Um, yeah, I think everyone's going to find it hot. Maybe being bigger is not an advantage, but I thought the same going into Nice. Yeah. Um, and didn't seem to matter. Daniela and I are probably two of the tallest girls. Obviously, but Daniela is a whole other caliber of athlete, but I feel that, yeah, we were both two tall girls coming off the climb. and top position. So. You know when I speak to some of these people who haven't been to Kona before to race it's really wonderful to see how uh, excited they are by it. They're not necessarily that intimidated. They know what's going to happen but you know um, in Imogen's case she just seemed like she was just excited by the opportunity mm -hmm. but she's third at 70.3 Worlds. She's trained in the heat before there's no reason why she can't be one of the contenders at the end of the day. Oh, I know. And she doesn't seem to be feeling that much pressure. Like, she totally comes across as relaxed. And I think she's placed well placed, kind of how Lucy Charles was a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. When she kind of showed up, you know, people knew that she eventually someday was going to be a great athlete and she had the talent to do well here. Yeah. Um, Imogen's in that same position, but you just never know when the breakthrough year is going to come. Oh, um, and I think that it's a place of power almost when you <laughs> when you don't know what to expect out there. I think sometimes oh, when you've done this race a million times, you know how hard it is. Let's go back to the Chrissy Wellington eras. Mm -hmm. You know, she came in here completely oblivious to the, the what almost Kona meant. Right. And she won. That's a great example of someone who came, you yes. know, who did <laughs> who did one. Iron Man. Yes. And then, and, and it wasn't, it was in the heat, and yep. she didn't really run that fast in... Um, Korea. Korea, that's yep. right. And then, and nobody expected anything. Yeah. And boom, she won the race. Yep. So, you know, you never know what can happen with someone like Imogen is a dark horse, for sure. Absolutely. But then we've also got that situation where we've got some people here on the island that have had long careers, but never really cracked it in Kona, or had the opportunity to race in Kona to their potential. Um, and we all know about Tim Don. Anyone who's followed the sport long enough mm. knows the name Tim Don. And he's been here to Hawaii before, but he's had some really bad luck. Um, he had that car accident a couple of years ago and broke his neck. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that is, a, is a massive story in its own right. I mean, the, the race was, it reverberated around here in Kona when we heard that news. Um, in the same year that Matt Russell had that bad That's accident. That's right. That's right. And Tim, we know that Tim had the talent to win here and has never really been able to show it. Yep. Um, he is He's fast. He was an Olympian. Yep. You know, he's had fast Ironman results. And so I think um, it's, I, it must be hard for someone yep. who, you know, being in his 40s now, kind of realizing that there's only going to be so many chances to make it happen. Yep. Um, so we, we asked that question. Um, of Tim, how he feels about being here on the island without racing. Yeah, it's, I, um, it's good. First of all, everyone comes up to me and goes, oh, good luck on Sunday. And I, half of them, I say, yeah, thanks. I don't have the heart to keep on saying, I'm not racing. <laughs> but no, I know I'm not ready to race and you need to be ready for this race. You cannot come in here not ready because of the course, because of the competition. Um, and I am actually enjoying it. Last year I knew I wasn't ready, but I wanted to finish for different reasons. So that for me was very special. But no, this year I'm not that I don't enjoy it, but I'm taking it all in. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, Sarah and Heather are going, when is this going to end? I want to get my feet up and relax. Well, I'm like, yeah, this is quite cool talking about triathlon. <laughs> so I, I am really enjoying it. And as I say, it's our job, but we really have a passion for the sport. and. Yeah, so, yeah, no, I'm really enjoying it, actually. 
So Tim's in his 40s, and I think when he posted his fastest ever Ironman titles at Ironman Brazil, um, didn't you race Brazil? I did, Bevan. I won Ironman Brazil, you know that. Did you break a world record? <laughs> I did not. You're in your 40s, aren't you? <laughs> I am. Oh, I am. Okay. Sorry, um, we must move on. <laughs> uh, but I think Tim's going to come back. I think there's unfinished business here in Kona. Mm. I'm pretty sure he's got a qualification race set up before the end of the year. So he may not be, he wants to be here. He, he said it in his interview. Um, he doesn't want to necessarily be here spectating again next year, uh, but I do think he'll be back. Yeah, and we do see a lot of athletes in their 40s performing now, you know, yeah. men and women. Didi Grace Bauer, yep. Koei. Yep. Um, uh, Andy Potts. Mm -hmm. He's in his 40s? Yeah, yeah, I think he is actually in his 40s. Yeah, so it is possible. Yeah, um, so is this a comeback? <laughs> For me? Yeah. No, I, I'm telling you, I am done. Done. <laughs> Equally so, and I'm in my 40s as well, although the viewers wouldn't have probably guessed that. <laughs> okay, so a lot, most pros who come to the Big Island, yep. right, they are coming because they feel that they can get in the top 10, yep. right, and that's because the prize money goes to 10. Yeah. Uh, and so we, I mean, you, you probably don't come here if you don't think you can go top 10, right? Well, look, it's a, it's a hard game, this professional race, and for a lot of reasons, people are here for uh, perceived sponsorship mm. commitments. Getting in the top 10 is extremely difficult across the men's and women's uh, ranks. You know, but we've also got some newcomers uh, who are here who have faced the same adversity as Tim Don. Um, and say in Kelsey Withrow's case, mm. uh, she actually had a horrendous accident a number of years ago that she's rehabilitated herself. And it was life-threatening, wasn't it? Life-threatening, yeah. You know? Um, but she's here on the Big Island for the first time and we caught up with Kelsey to find out what she thinks about race day. A, a roller coaster ride to get here? Yeah, four Ironmans later, I'm here. <laughs> you finally got here. I finally uh, did. We met in Port Mac. Yes. Okay, so we're a good luck charm for I you. I know. Big, t uh, big race on the Big Island. Yeah. Are you tired from all the racing or how do you feel? No, I feel great. I mean, I, I usually give myself a day of recovery every week, so I... You do too. I do. Yeah. I, I believe in a full, a full day off of not doing anything and kind of helps mentally, you know, I'm... Yeah, I mean, this has been my dream, so... Okay. You, I feel good. You're finally here. Yeah. When was the last race in relation to Kona? Because it was quite a late qualification, wasn't it? Yeah. And then you went and raced... Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah, that didn't get so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's been almost one good one, one not it's so kind good of, one. Yeah, I've kind of done... Yeah, so this one's supposed to be good. Okay. Yeah. For you here on the Big Island as a, as a rookie and something you always dreamed of doing, talk me through what you would imagine would be the best performance for Kelsey. And it... Yeah, so for me, the best performance would be a top 10 for me. Um, yeah, it's, I know deep down that I have the potential to do it. I just have to pull something really special out. Yeah. And, you know, everyone is good here. Everyone's great here. So, you know, it might seem very unlikely that I'll do that. But I think if I have a good race, that it's possible. You've found a run that has eluded you uh, in the Ironman <laughs> yes. distance. Uh, Port Macquarie was the, your PB for the year. Yeah. What training have you done on the run? Because this is our run segment and every social media post I've seen from you. I'm running a lot. I'm <laughs> you're, running. Yeah, you're running, yeah. <laughs> you have been running a lot. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So what's the what's the key session that you think is going to be in your training that's going to help you here in Kona? Um, you know, I actually haven't been doing that much running leading up. Um, but I would say, you know, I've had some really hard runs off my long bikes okay. to try and get ready. I've actually been really working on my bike. Okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, so running, um, you know, actually just being healthy is one thing. I haven't, the last couple years, um, I've actually been healthy. So my run has started progressing to yeah. where it should be. Okay. Yeah. So you've been building a lot of long runs off uh, long bikes and mm -hmm. that's the way to get strong for race day? Yeah, I think, well hopefully, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> We've kind of come full circle there yep. from Lionel at the top of the show, yeah. who doesn't ever, sounds like, run off the bike, yep. or rarely, and to Kelsey who's done a lot of her training as running off the bike. 
I think there's two schools of thought here. Um, Ironman's a strength game, and so a lot of people feel that they build strength by running on tired legs, mm-hmm. which is, in Kelsey's case, long brick runs off long bikes. Lionel's uh, wanting to make sure that he doesn't mute his, his speed, so he doesn't mm. want to perform training sessions where his legs are heavily fatigued um, or too heavily fatigued for him not to be able to tap into that speed side of things. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, um, different training methodologies have won this race over different years. Um, And it just illustrates there's not one size fits all. Right. Well, and honestly, the training plan that works for you is the one that you believe in. Absolutely. Absolutely. that's the most important piece. Yeah, totally. And working with pros and age groupers alike, they need to understand where you're trying to arrive at. And Mm -hmm. they put some faith in coaches to arrive at that point. Um, Some coaches will get out it coming from this angle. Some will get at it from this angle, but as long as you get there, and as Alistair Brownlee said in a previous episode of ours, arrive with a toolkit um, mm-hmm. that is going to be appropriate to the demands of the race, uh, and then you're going to be able to race well. Right, and a big part of that toolkit is also the nutrition piece, Absolutely. which we haven't even touched yet on our show. And highly debatable uh, schools of thought there. There's going to be two different angles um, from the low carb to the high carb. I'll debate uh, that with you, Bevan. <laughs> that's right, because I sit here as a low carb proponent. You sit here as Where's a, my candy? As a gummy I bear. I always have candy. <laughs> as a gummy yeah. bear proponent. <laughs> um, but also the, the gender differences as well. Right, absolutely. Um, and I believe uh, really wholeheartedly in the fact that women and men need to be uh, different nutritionally in their approach to Iron Man as well. Um, So we will talk to some people who are experts in the industry um, on that topic. Hydration in a hot race. Hydration, electrolytes, so important. You know, we've seen people lose half their colon out here because because they're not well hydrated. Absolutely. It's important. That was me earlier on today. (laughs) If you saw me at the Lionel Sanders uh, interview, I was severely dehydrated. We we saw you at your worst today. Dehydrated to that Ola hard seltzer that I drank just before was perfect. It just it got you topped up. Yeah, topped right. Up. And do not miss tomorrow's episode because we are going to announce our contest and you can win a four eye power meter. Worth a thousand US dollars? Easily. And you, those guys and their power meters are making some big inroads into that space at the moment. Um, and I know I'll be riding one. And, and I don't ride, but if I did ride, I would ride a four-eye power meter. You're more retired than I am. I'm quite retired. You're, you're quite retired. But I'll be riding one, which I'm really, really excited about. And it's awesome to be able to give away a prize for all the people that are watching the show. So if you want to get involved, tune in tomorrow. Tune in tomorrow.